Um, because in order for, for us to, to work coming back to campus, we have to be leaders. And in order for us to potentially even think about playing athletics, um, what sort of Carol and, and Dean Jefferson and Dean McRae uh, and, and Dr. Lutz said last night, that goes a thousand times fold for, for athletes because it is that much more impactful from a risk perspective. If we're gonna potentially engage in competition and practices and travel, um, it's that much more escalated. And so, um, you know, that level of responsibility, that leadership accountability, that selfishness even goes much more so at a higher level for athletes. It, it's, it's plain and simple. Um, and so those are some of the things that I want folks to, to sort of keep in mind as we go through this. If you look around the NCAA, um, landscape, you're starting to see dominoes fall. Um, the Ivy League, the Patriot League, the MEAC have been a few conferences that have come out and said um, that they are not playing fall sports, that they're going to try to move forward with sports uh, in the spring. The Big East just came out today and said that they're sort of delaying their decision, um, that they are um, going to uh, see how the situation plays out, cancel non-conference competition, uh, and make a decision down the road. A number of other uh, conferences are doing that. Um, and um, I know I can share right now that for the A-10, which 19 of our 21 sports play, our primary conference affiliation, will likely have um, a, a decision by tomorrow. Um, I, I, there are a number of things on the table. I think um, a delay of some sort uh, of, of potentially not having non-conference competition and or a start um, date around, you know, later in the fall, October 1, or even pushing to the spring are all options on the table. Um, I think that um, the sense I get is, is flexibility is important. And so um, whatever that decision is, it will likely happen um, tomorrow and we will adjust accordingly based off of um, the A-10 and, and, the, and the conference decision. But you're starting to see um, the NCAA even came out again and said that um, the fall is in jeopardy. And if you're not thinking that, it is, it's the reality. Um, in order for there to be fall sports, in order for us to have practice competition, et cetera, things would need to drastically change. And they're not moving in the right direction, but until sort of um, it moves to that point, you know, we're gonna continue to try to make it happen, understanding that safety and, and well-being is our number one priority. And we're not gonna do it if, if we can't, if we can't um, you know, confirm that. Um, and so um, I think from our perspective, um, we want to play sports, like we want to come back, we want to play athletics, but um, not at, at the sacrifice for, for in terms of doing what's right and doing what's um, most important for our safety, health and well-being. Um, so um, I think there's a lot that's going to happen in the next couple of weeks. There's, again, there will be a decision around the A-10 tomorrow. Um, but again, all I would ask is that everybody continues to, to be flexible and work with us as we, we move through this time. Um, we sent over um, the, to, to, to scholar athletes the COVID-19 action plan that was put together by Dr. Lutz and Beth Hayford, um, our head of sports performance. Um, and it outlines a number of um, key protocols that if we are to come back and um, to practice and to compete, um, specific guidelines and protocols that we would try to adhere to. Um, and it even talks about um, uh, potential protocols uh, in place. I think one of the things that the NCAA just put out today is the third iteration of its resocialization guidelines. Essentially what they put out is, if institutions are to come back and play, um, here is the highly recommended, not mandated, they can't mandate it, it's the highly recommended protocols that schools would need to follow. And the, the testing protocol is really, really extensive. And um, President Cole and I both agree that if we are to play athletics, um, we are not gonna short the testing protocol. We would adhere to the highest standard of protocols for the NCAA not other institutions may not be in that boat we would be like we're not looking at playing sports if we're not adhering to the highest standards so what does that mean it would potentially mean um uh, testing protocols upon arrival symptomatic testing surveillance testing and pre-competition testing based on high medium and low contact uh, risk sports um, um if you the, the guy that came out again list high contact sports as men's and women's basketball field hockey football lacrosse volleyball wrestling um, that would mean testing upon arrival, surveillance testing, which means random testing of 25% of your team every two weeks, symptomatic testing if you're showing symptoms, and weekly, essentially pre-competition testing. For medium contact sports, which could potentially include uh, men's and women's tra uh, cross-country track and field, men's and women's soccer and baseball, um, it would be testing upon arrival, surveillance testing, and symptomatic, 
And then for low contact risk sports, which is swimming and diving, men's and women's golf, men's and women's tennis, um, testing upon arrival and some modified version of surveillance and symptomatic testing. Um, so the NCAA guidelines are pretty clear in terms of um, for institutions to get back to playing competitively, this is what is highly recommended, recommended and Davidson Athletics would try to adhere to that um, to the fullest. Um, so that's one thing, again, that um, people ask, you know, what are the standards that you would try to put in place along with our, our COVID-19 action protocols outlined in the document that we sent? Um, the testing protocol would be to the highest standard possible. Um, and that's the only way that we would in, engage in athletics. And we're, we're committed to that if we can get it done. Um, social expectations around athletics as well. Um, again, President Cole and others just talked about um, really a social construct. Again, it's, it's, it's really difficult. We're asking a lot of everybody and we'd be asking a lot more of, ath of athletes as well. Um, some things that you could potentially think about are um, understanding, um, you know, moving towards a, a sort of a, a um, self-isolation potentially. Let's say we're back and we're competing and a team travels uh, by bus um, and they don't stay the night, but they come back. Um, or maybe they do they stay the night um, and they come back the next day. You could envision, again, athletes um, with the classes that the way that they're structured, choosing that week not to go to class in person. Some classes, again, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, as you know, are online, some are hybrid, which means in-person and um, remote options, and some are flex, which are in-person but have the remote capabilities. Um, you could be in a class where it's a hybrid opportunity, um, and the week that you come back from, from a competition, or the weekend you come back that next week, you know, you're choosing to, as a team, to self-isolate because you are incurring risk. You did incur risk. You were competing against another team, you traveled um, and, and, and asking and working with athletic teams and programs to say, hey, you know what, for that week, we may not be in person, um, or we may take extreme social distancing um, uh, measures. Again, understanding that this isn't about us. Um, we're more worried about the people that um, are, are immunocompromised, have uh, underlying health conditions, faculty, staff, um, folks that are older in the older age range, et cetera. Um, that's the type of thinking that we have to embrace um, and would have to commit to um, socially uh, and culturally, um, you know, if, if we're back to, to, to playing sports. Um, I do want to touch upon um, the sort of the academic course load reduction uh, that came out um, from academic affairs. Um, everybody knows that um, the, the, the course load um, was reduced um, from for 32 to 30 for all of the um, current classes um, and, and, and also the um, per semester course load has been dropped from four to three, um, which we, we completely support. We think it's critically important. Um, one thing that we do um, advise all of our scholar athletes to do is make sure you talk to Katie McNay and or your academic advisor around NCAA eligibility. Um, because of that change in you being able to take um, fewer amount of classes throughout the semester, um, we all just want to make sure that you're aware of where your academic standing is such that it does put um, certain folks that may have had a misstep or may have you know, failed a course and um, in a potentially um, sensitive situation where you wanna know that um, you're taking the right amount of courses. You might say, hey, I'm gonna take three courses because that's what makes sense, but understand it may be better off for you to take four courses and not three. It's probably better for incoming freshmen to take um, at least four courses one of the two semesters upcoming, right? So just understanding that and making sure that you're clear on, on most of our scholar athletes, again, evidenced by all 21 teams with over 3.0 GPAs in, in, in the spring semester and um, three, over 314, I believe, um, scholar athletes on the commissioner's honor roll, like we're in good shape. Again, it's just understanding how um, that change by the academic affairs could impact you um, and your academic standing. Um, and I, so with that, I do wanna move to questions that I've received. Um, that we received beforehand and then open it up to questions that folks may have. Again, please feel free um, to, to reach out um, if you have questions um, and, and send them through the chat function um, um, to me directly or to Katie McNay. So one of the first questions um, that we got, what makes Davidson uniquely capable of resuming fall sports when the Ivy League, Patriot League, NESCAC schools have stopped fall sports? It's a good question. And I think it speaks to the testing protocol that I mentioned before. I think that a number, well, I don't think, I know that a number of those conferences made those decisions based upon the, um, the standard that the NCAA that was potentially put, putting out around testing protocols and what it would take 
to test athletes pre-competition in high contact sports and then have surveillance testing and all the testing that I just mentioned um, throughout the specific uh, seasons. Um, and they did not want to do that. They didn't think they were capable of doing that and they did not necessarily want to do that in some instances. So I think what's different with Davidson is we would be um, wanting to do that. Um, what I don't want is um, parents, and a lot of them were on this call, to look around the country and see, hey, you know, school A is doing this, school B is doing this. I have another kid at this school that's a scholar athlete and they're doing this, why are we not? Um, we're gonna make sure that our standards are up to the highest capabilities. And so I think what makes us potentially uniquely capable, I'm not saying that it's gonna happen. Again, we're not sure, we're moving towards it. But if we resumed athletics, I think the difference between us and other, uh, other schools that have made their decisions already to say, we're not playing sw uh, sports in the fall, is that we would be adhering to the highest of standards. And those leagues um, either chose not to or didn't think that they could um, adhere to those standards. Um, with North Carolina cases rising, would regional play still be considered our best option for non-conference play? It is something in consideration. Um, some of you are aware for six sports across the A-10, um, men's and women's soccer, field hockey, volleyball um, in the fall, and then um, baseball and lacrosse in the spring. The A-10 um, in the, earlier this summer already moved to reduce con the conference schedule by 25% and regionalize those schedules. So these are primarily the sports that have um, you know, uh, Olympic sports that, that are, that have a, a consistent um, schedule um, in the set, a, a traditional schedule, I should say. Other sports like uh, men's and women's tennis don't play a traditional conference schedule. Um, these sports do. And so, um, you know, the A-10 across those sports has already made that decision to cut conference by 25% and to regionalize. So for example, as it stands right now, a women's volleyball team would not be flying to Rhode Island to play. They would only be busing to regionally based A-10 conference opponents. Um, and so um, it's a good question with cases rising. I think we've already preemptively made those decisions to try to limit air travel as much as possible. And if there is travel to keep it regionalized and, and, and on buses. And that, that, that thinking and rationale will continue. Um, can you discuss the possibility of athletes being re relocated to live separately from other students? How likely is that to happen? What would it look like? So we've already been working with RLO. Um, we specifically started with um, uh, incoming freshmen first um, to work with incoming freshmen around making sure that um, we were trying to create cohorts and to um, keep athletes together as much as possible. So we did that through um, our freshman pairings and working with the RLO. Um, the pairings have not changed for that have been come about in the spring. What is being evaluated right now is um, clusters of athletes within different dorms. So not that we're going to move people out of different dorms that they've been into, is that within specific dorms and on specific halls, there may be way f ways for us to cluster athletes in common areas. Um, some athletes are rooming with athletes, some athletes are not rooming with athletes. And so it's an imperfect science. It's not, there's no way, we're not going to move to a, a, a situation where we have all athletes in one dorm or all athletes rooming with athletes. Um, but we want to try to um, create clusters as much as possible. Again, understanding that um, scholar athletes, potentially if we're competing, are engaging in, and incurring more risk. And so that is something that is um, being um, evaluated right now. For medium high risk sports, will we have team practice off the bat? Or if not, how long until we start team practice versus individual small group workouts? Um, those are being worked through right now. Again, the protocol that we have in place really starts teams off slow. Um, and I'll get to that a little bit later um, around the, the weight room um, and strength piece, but um, not jumping right back into practice and team practices. It really is based upon kind of individual um, and spaced out socially distanced um, programming and practices initially. And those conversations um, coaches having with Dr. Lutz and with Beth Hayford and her staff um, uh, will sort of dictate that. Um, another second part of this question was the the guideline talked about the low max of the weight room and if there are alternatives, um, meaning how many people are in the weight room at one time, just to give folks an, an idea of what we've been doing. Since June 1st, we've had roughly 30, 35 um, scholar athletes back um, training on campus. Um, that number is probably up to closer to 50 right now. Um, we did not move into the weight room. We are outside on the turf. Um, we have a tent out onto the turf. Um, Beth Hayford and, and, and Dr. Lutz felt like it was important for us um, bringing everybody back to stay outside um, to, to mitigate sort of the, the inside um, density. Uh, and so our workouts have been outside 
Um, and what that means is even when we do move inside, um, the high max, meaning the, the highest amount of people that you want in the weight room um, is, is going to be, if, if people are not wearing masks, it's five people inside based upon people being on every other rack. If they are wearing masks, it's 10 people inside. Um, for the first two weeks, everybody's going to train outside. Um, and that's going to be coordinated um, with Coach Evan Simon and his strength coach staff, um, and then phasing in teams um, into indoor programming, um, you know, accordingly. Um, and so we do have alternatives. I think even once we phase in, again, the numbers don't work out. We're not going to have be able to have everybody working inside the weight room at one time. So outdoor workouts will still continue um, when and where feasible. Um, and so to integrate that into our plan moving forward for the foreseeable future. Um, if athletic competitions are held on campus, will other students be allowed to attend as spectators? If their spectators are allowed to attend, so will social distancing be enforced? Um, it's a good question. We've really honestly just been focusing on getting back and return to play. And once we know where we are um, and make a decision, then um, moving forward with sports, we're working on scenarios around um, spectators, not non-spectators. We're putting scenarios together right now for all of our sports, not just our ticketed sports, for all sports. Um, and, and looking obviously at, um, in conjunction with local and state guidelines, right? Um, local and state guidelines are pretty clear in terms of um, how many people you can have outside at a given moment, depending on what phase you're in. We're currently in phase two. It's different obviously in phase three. There is a subsection that, um, uh, that is different for colleges, universities, pro sports. And so we'll work within what, whatever is best within those guidelines. Um, so I, I don't have an answer for that yet right now. Just know that we're looking at different scenarios. We're going to take everything into account. The fact that outdoor sports need to be treated differently, potentially than indoor sports, just in terms of um, outdoor airborne, more space um, versus indoor, more enclosed, et cetera. So all of those things are being factored into. So we don't yet know what fans in the stands may or may not look like, but um, those are things that we are going to um, continue to work on moving forward. Um, you mentioned that if traveling for an away game, you suggest us not going to class for the entire next week. Basketball spans both semesters. We have away games. Uh, we, may, we may have away games every week. Will we be expected to do online classes our entire season? No. I, again, I don't think that I'm not advocating for scholar athletes to just take online classes. I think in certain instances, in certain situations, I do think it could be feasible for athletes, again, in season, and we're talking about in-season athletes, um, to be able to utilize the remote options that we're providing um, to, again, to create greater distance when they're in season. So again, it's imperfect, um, but I'm not, we're not advocating for, um, for to do online classes for, for the entire season. Um, per se. We're saying that specific points in the season, potentially long road trips, and you're going for a specific uh, long, uh, specific amount of time. Um, home games versus away games are different, et cetera. So I think it's a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I just think that we have to think through all options and critically along those lines that are we doing the most that we possibly can? Again, um, the, the, you know, are we doing the most that we can to mitigate risk? If understanding that coming back as a risk, coming, understanding that playing sports potentially, not potentially, playing sports is a risk. Are we doing as much as we can within that to understand the trade-offs that if we're playing sports, we might have to sacrifice in other areas. So I'm not advocating to take just online courses. I'm saying that we need to be smart and, and, and really figure out how best to distance ourselves when we can and when it makes the most sense. How, do, how does eligibility work if we wanna sit out this upcoming year and would it burn a year also? That's still being worked out through the NCAA. I think once, um, um, the, the, once we have a decision just on the fall sports season, um, again, and that decision is coming tomorrow. I think somebody asked that maybe they came on late, but we will, we should know about the decision for the A-10 tomorrow. Um, it's probably similar to, um, how the spring works. If you look at the spring and the blanket waiver that was provided for spring sport athletes who essentially lost, um, the duration of their season, um, you know, if it moves towards that, and, and honestly, we could be in a situation where we make a decision, other leagues make a decision, we could be in a situation where the NCAA cancels fall championships next week, and then it sort of fully shifts everything to the spring and, and trying to conduct that. So um, it really depends on what happens, um, but I do think that they, whatever happens, it would be treated similar to um, the spring and being able to allow um, scholar athletes, if 
let's say we move to the spring and, you know, we're not even able to move forward with spring seasons. Again, we have no idea what's going to happen. Um, th then they would provide the opportunity to get that like, like they did in the spring um, to have another year of eligibility. I think that's what would happen. Folks in the NCAA are talking along those lines. Um, but I think, again, it's, it's, it remains to be seen. That's why I think flexibility is, is critically important. Um, A10, we talked about fans in the stands. We talked about what is the process for bringing players to campus? How are we managing the transition process to minimize risk to players? So uh, the process, it's different. I think if, once we know what the A10 is going to do, we'll know whether fall sports are going to be coming in early or not. Um, I think if you, you know, based on the town hall from, from yesterday for students and parents, that um, we are working to institute um, uh, at-home testing for students before they come um, and understanding that that is a snapshot. I mean, people are like, what happens in the, uh, the travel from, you know, you get your test result, you're, you're negative. What happens when you travel on campus? We understand that. This is an imperfect science, but understanding a, get, understanding a snapshot and getting a baseline is critically important. Um, so we're trying to push to have all students tested beforehand. For those that can't, for some are on campus right now. Obviously, we have some working out, um, and and they obviously are not home, so they would be tested upon us um, officially getting everybody back and be part of that testing window. For those that get at-home testing kits and they get lost or they don't get a test result or it shows up to the wrong address, they would be tested immediately upon arrival. So the college is putting protocols in place to have all students tested either beforehand, either upon arrival. And that also is going the same for um, staff on a voluntary basis for those that want to get uh, tested. And um, because our coaches and, and, and administration are frontward facing, we would also um, recommend that our coaches and staff would be tested as well. Um, so we're, it's a little different from, it'll, it'll really vary based upon what comes out of the decision around the A-10 and what we're going to do with fall sports. Um, you know, it could be that fall sports are coming back early and, you know, they're tested earlier before um, regular students come. It could be that we're delaying and they're not coming back early. And so they're tested in line with the, the regular protocol, um, which would mean um, potentially that they're tested around our physicals when they come back. Um, so there are a number of different options that we're looking at. I think um, one of the biggest things that the college is doing is just, just around moving as a whole um, is, is really trying to, the moving process is going to look completely different. Um, limiting the amount of people that can come to move in. Um, we usually have our freshmen, not even freshmen, I think our football team helping freshman orientation move in. That's not likely not going to happen. So there are a number of things that we're doing, again, that we just can't say we can think we can do everything the way that we've been done before. We really are trying to put protocols in place to make sure um, that we are mitigating as much risk as possible. Um, when all student athletes are on campus, who would decide what athletes teams will be allowed in the weight room and a part of that five person group? That'll be decided by Coach Evan Simon um, and his team along with Beth Hayford and, and Dr. Lutz. Working, they're working on that protocol now. The good thing about having scholar athletes training on campus start since June 1st has been, we've learned a lot. We've been able to shift protocols in place, put guidelines in place, get an understanding for the rhythm of what training could look like. And so that will all be put together by um, the, uh, the strength team and sports performance team. Do we know when we'll have a P decision from the PFL? Good question. Again, keep in mind, 19 of our 21 teams play in the Atlantic 10. Football is in the PFL. Wrestling is in the SOCON. I'll start with wrestling, them being a, a winter sport. No decisions have been made about winter sports or are even being sort of pondered around winter sports at all right now, just in terms of focusing on the fall and then sort of moving sequentially. So um, I know that um, the Wrestling Association is having conversations around potentially what to do with wrestling. Um, but that has a little bit more runway, and so no specific decision yet. The PFL obviously being a fall sport, um, and the PFL being one of two conferences in the country that is just football only, um, we're in conversations with the PFL leadership, um, with the A-10 being our primary uh, conference, such that we will coordinate you, uh, with the PFL. Like, you could envision a world in which, you know, keep in mind both Dayton and Davidson are in the A-10 and the PFL. Um, you can envision a world in which fall sports are delayed to a certain date. And because of that, um, you know, we work with the PFL and the PFL moves to just a non-conference slate, right? So let's say that fall sports were delayed to August, October 1st. The PFL says we're just going to go conference only, which would mean their first game would not start to September 26th. 
and that would be how we'd align sort of the the the, the football decision potentially um, with the rest of the fall sports. So so hopefully that that makes a little bit of sense. Um, why are we willing to test the student athletes so frequently, but not willing to expand that to our entire Davidson community to keep more people safe, especially considering sports are supplemental to our education? It's a good question. Um, I think because of the risk. I think in looking at the risk variations, um, the, the highest risk, some of the highest risk comes from, um, is gonna come from athletics. If you look at not necessarily the low risk sports, medium risk sports to an extent, but the high risk, high contact, excuse me, risk sports, um, I think it's, it's, it's understanding that when you're um, uh, trying to create a bubble on campus with the, the community, athletics is, is an outlier. You are playing against um, teams that are coming in, um, and you're also potentially traveling and playing against other teams outside of Davidson. And so the risk is just higher. And so in order to have sports, like we want to adhere to the highest um, potential standard around testing. I do know that the school is looking at surveillance testing just for the student body as a whole, right? So um, I mentioned the potential 25, 50% random batch testing. That is something that I think the school is looking at as well. Um, but I think, again, um, it's just looking at sort of the, 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 the risk meter and understanding that by en potentially engaging in sports, um, we would be incurring more risk as scholar athletes. Um, and so um, the, the focus would be to make sure that um, because of that risk that we're adhering to the highest standards possible. Whereas again, the, the, the ideally, again, the, 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 the non-athlete population and everybody else, they're not engaging. We're trying to create a bubble. It's imperfect. You have faculty that are gonna be teaching class in person and going to Walmart afterwards, to go to Harris Teeter to pick up groceries. You have scholar athletes, you have students that are in class and then they're off campus living. Like this is not perfect. This is, this is a, in a lot of ways, it's like, it, it, it's a plan that with a sponge and there's a ton of different holes. It's just, it's, it really is sort of trying to create the best version um, of how to move this forward. So I get it. I embrace the imperfections. I understand that um, there's not a perfect answer. Some of the things that we do, um, there's always gonna be gaps. We're just trying to do it the best that we can. But again, it is a good question. And, and I do think that that's part of the reason I know that delaying potentially sports makes sense because testing becomes less saturated. The testing market is really saturated right now. Turnaround time is really long. Testing becomes cheaper. It becomes more readily available. It becomes more precise. And so as that happens, I can envision more testing happening, not even just specifically with scholar athletes, but with the general community as a whole. Is football going to have some type of face mouth covering to attach to the face mask when playing? It's a good question. We actually worked with Under Armour to order um, Under Armour masks, which are potentially designed, as they say, we weren't able to get samples ahead of time, but they're designed to cover the face and be able to be uh, compete and play. Um, we ordered, um, I can't remember the numbers, but I think two for each scholar athlete um, and understanding that if they work, that we'll, we'll, we'll invest in and order a bunch more. So, um, it, you know, the, the school is gonna provide masks. We're telling folks to bring masks. Um, we're working with Atrium Health. I think they gave us 4,000 masks additionally and then working with Under Armour for performance specific masks for our scholar athletes. Um, so yes, hopefully it does work. We just weren't able to get samples ahead of time to see how it exactly fits with say a football helmet. But again, we're trying everything. Um, what are the testing arrangements for internationals testing upon arrival? So um, those uh, sh international students should have received emails from the international student program already. I, I, I saw those go out. Um, I know that international students are going to be going through um, a quarantine protocol upon arrival um, and uh, a testing protocol. Um, oh, sorry, I misread that question wrong. I'm sorry. Are international students going to be tested even if they have been in quarantine? Um, that, I think, yes, they will be tested even after quarantine. Yes. So not necessarily upon arrival. I think international students are going direct to quarantine. Um, and then it's almost like after quarantine, be tested again, just to make sure. But yes, the, the, the goal is to make sure that everybody is tested um, and even after a quarantine for that to take place. Will the A-10 decision tomorrow have an effect on the other conferences? Um, it'll have the effect on conferences maybe around SOCON and, and the PFL, potentially even on a national stage. I think the, the Atlantic 10 is viewed as a, as, a, as, a, as a 
bigger conference that the, the moves by the Patriot League, the moves by the Ivy League didn't necessarily move the needle as much. I think a move by the A-10 will move the needle a little bit further in line with kind of like what the Big East uh, came out with today. So again, I think it all remains to be to be seen. You've seen the Pac-12 come out and say non-conference only. You've seen the Big Ten come out and say non-conference only. Um, so I think, again, I think it remains to be seen based on the decision that, that comes out. If it's decided tomorrow that fall sports are canceled or delayed, will our move in uh, uh, for August 3rd potentially be pushed back as well as to the normal August 13th date? Yes, so that's all up for discussion. If, if something was to come out and say there is a postponement um, and we're not having sports in the fall, we would work with uh, coaches and teams and Beth Hayford and her staff to figure out what is the best time um, to move in. Um, but it likely, if there's a postponement and we're starting at a later date, or if there was a cancellation, um, we would work to push back that, that arrival date to the, around the normal time frame. But again, it's, that's where the flexibility is coming in. What are the options for students who don't feel comfortable with the unnecessary additional risk of participating in athletics? Those are conversations that um, you, you have to bring that to your coach and, and to the senior uh, sport, sport administrator. Um, but we're happy and willing to have those conversations. I can't say, exam for example, what um, those options are. I think it's on a case-by-case -case basis, but we want to hear from you. If, if folks do not feel comfortable, um, you know, please come to us, talk to your coaches, talk to us. Um, we want to have that conversation to, to walk through what could potentially be done. Because again, it's, this is um, an imperfect science and, and we want to be able to meet people where they are. So I think it's, it's just about speaking up and saying that and having the conversation. Um, from Beth, uh, the question earlier about football helmets and face coverings, we are also looking into face shields for the helmet. So that would likely be for all sports that potentially utilize helmets. I know some in lacrosse uh, wear helmets as well. Will high contact sports have minimal or no contact Sorry, some of these questions are not written the best. Will high contact sports have minimal or no contact practices be required? So that's part of what um, the, the, the guideline, the protocol action plan that we put in place. Um, practice plans are gonna look different. Um, for the high contact sports especially, um, you know, we are um, going to, to look to work and we do have to fit in um, contact. You do have to scrimmage, like that has to happen. That, that has to happen for a safety perspective. If we're playing, it doesn't make sense to throw people out there and not have the ability to scrimmage at some point. Like that has to happen um, because there are safety concerns of just throwing people into competition. But training um, and working with our coaches and Dr. Lutz and, and Beth will look different. And I think our coaches are, are working right now through what could practices look like, um, what could more individualized workout look um, uh, or, or breaking into small group works um, look like. And so I think all of the practices will look different, especially around high contact and medium contact sports. So I think it's working with our coaches um, and working with Dr. Lutz to make sure that we're providing a safe environment. Um, have you heard that the CAA um, uh, canceled fall sports? I have not heard that. Um, but again, I don't know. I've heard a lot of things back and forth. I know People are, um, cons or everything's on the table. Everybody's considering certain things, but I have not heard anything specifically about, about them. If we get information tomorrow that we aren't having, uh, sorry, if we get information tomorrow that we aren't having fall sports, does that mean practice isn't happening? If we do that, will our practices need to be in small groups? So I would treat it sort of like uh, spring sports, right? So um, let's say fall sports are postponed or canceled and you would almost be treated in some way like spring sports, right? Spring sports are still back and still practicing and have a non-traditional out of season um, experience. We would work within NCAA regulations and the A-10 to try to figure out, um, it could be, it may not look exactly like traditional spring sports. Like it may not be the same countable hours that uh, men's women's tennis or baseball is doing. It could be something, um, it, may, it may not be the full amount of practice that would be if we were playing. It could be something we were in the middle. I don't know. I think we're trying to leave that open and not have that set such that when there is a decision, we'll talk through what makes the most sense. Because again, if we're not playing in the fall, the push will be to have a season in the spring. And what does that look like um, to change the, the, the training sequences to make sure that we are getting ready for um, the spring? So it could look a little similar to what spring sports will be doing in the fall. Could look a little different, but we're not sure. Fall sports were delayed. Could winter and spring sports be pushed back also? 
um, would there be overlap between sports? Yes, yes, and yes. Nothing's off the table. Um, I, we have not talked about winter sports right now um, or spring sports for that matter. The focus has just been on the fall, but nothing is off the table. Um, as of right now, at least for the A-10, winter sports um, and, and, and with the wrestling and the SOCON um, have not been discussed. Um, there is a lot of crossover though. There are some winter sports like a swimming and diving, like a men's and women's basketball, like a wrestling that crossover into fall, spring, et cetera. Um, so those conversations are gonna be had very quickly. Um, but um, I think that um, that remains to be seen. So um, again, the, the previous question, if fall sports were canceled and pushed to the spring, we still would have practices. What that looks like, I'm not sure. It would probably, again, be in line potentially with spring sports and how they practice in the fall or something a little bit more. Um, and there is the potential for a delay for, for other seasons. Again, it is really going sequentially. If sports are canceled, no competition. Yeah, I think I answered that. There would still be practice. Are sports that are out of season in the fall going to be able to have practices and or travel this semester? So that's a good question. Um, I think it remains to be seen. You know, if fall sports are canceled, um, it's likely that we may limit travel or competition for out of season sports as well in the fall. It just wouldn't make sense if we're trying to mitigate risk as much as possible. But again, practice and training and all of that would still um, would still be going on. Again, we'd be preparing for um, the spring. And there could be overlap. It's kind of crazy to think about, but we could have all of our sports going on at one time in the spring. It, it kind of blows my mind to think about that. Um, Davidson is set up better than most schools in that regard because if you look at our facility breakdown, if you look at how we're structured, it's a huge strain on the, the, the training room. It's a huge strain on um, strength and, and conditioning. It's a huge strain on game management. Um, but that is something that everybody has to sort of be prepared to do. And that's what um, programs are talking about. I know the A-10, even before the um, decision is made, is already looking at what could a spring season look like where you're having to play fall sports in the spring. So everything is, 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 is on the table. Um, when can we expect more information from Davidson following the A-10 tomorrow? So I have um, already set a meeting with coaches uh, tomorrow and, and staff tomorrow morning, such that hopefully provide an update from them to them after the A-10 meeting um, to then provide an update to, to, to players. So hopefully tomorrow morning. Um, my sense is the A-10 makes a decision. Uh, I'm able to let coaches know, administrators know, they're able to let you know, and then a press release would go out. So tomorrow. With the college offering night classes, has there been efforts to minimize practice class conflicts? Yes, we've talked about this. Um, and it's something that's an ever going, evolving process. Um, again, we agree with the decision to offer night classes, just in terms of being able to limit uh, classes, uh, class sizes, class density. It just potentially puts a strain on athletics. I think the way that they're structuring is such that um, night classes, every class that's offered, if it has a night session, should have uh, during the day session offered as well. And the other good thing about, um, I think IT is moving us to Zoom Cloud such that all classes that are recorded on Zoom will be moved to the cloud, including potentially transcripts of the classes. And so we saw this a little bit in the spring. We've been talking about this in athletics for a long time. Take COVID, take this current situation out of it that we're in right now. Um, it would actually be good for scholar athletes to have the ability um, to have um, recorded classes, more recorded class options, remote class opportunities, especially when we're traveling on the road. And so I do think because we're in this world where a number of our classes um, potentially are online or a hybrid flex, a mix of both, um, being able to utilize those remote or recorded options are something that we're going to look into. But Academic Affairs, the Educational Policy Committee certainly is aware um, of um, the night classes and being able to provide as many options as possible, um, repeat options um, within those potential classes. Will winter sport non-conference be delayed, canceled? Not sure. Good question. Again, I think we just have not talked about the winter sports yet. It's, it's, it's coming. All the focus has been on the fall sports. Was canceling sports ever considered? If it's not safe enough to play fall sports, why is it safe enough to practice? Um, I think the question, the, 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 the sentiment there is you're still in-house. You're still um, creating a bubble on sort of with just your players um, and you're not competing, right? The, the, the big risk comes from, from 
um, there's no difference potentially in um, potentially even being in a class um, uh, than sort of competing. The, the risk is higher, especially for contact sports. But again, we're sort of within our bubble in our community. The risk is that much more elevated as soon as you're competing and traveling against teams that are coming in or traveling and going to their place. And so that's why um, if canceling sports and potentially pushing off practice in our minds is still something that um, we would work through. And again, we would still have the requisite testing protocols in place, um, just maybe not sort of to the level of, of testing pre-competition because there would not be competition, but we would still have um, surveillance testing, still have symptomatic testing um, to make sure that even if we're engaging in practices and playing, um, we're still trying to mitigate as much risk as possible. Will all locker rooms be closed? That's a great question. Um, we right now are working in a protocol by which, um, at least for the first part of the, the season when we come back, locker rooms would be used on a very minimal basis. Working with our teams and our coaches to, um, to, to create a, a protocol whereby there are shifts for showers, um, whereby we're trying to limit the amount of people in the locker room one time. Um, so I think our guidelines are such that we're really trying to, to limit density um, as much as possible and, and the locker rooms are a part of that. Um, and so I think part of our protocol is rethinking how, um, how we use locker, locker rooms, how that space is utilized now. Sometimes they're used as gathering points or studying points or hangout points. And that, that's just not gonna be the case if we're you know, moving forward, if we are able to, to practice and get um, sports off the ground. Um, and so um, I think part of that is, is outlined a little bit in the COVID action plan. Um, but I think it's rethinking how our locker rooms are used, how small spaces are used. I mean, think for example, team meetings, um, per the uh, local and state guidelines, you're not right now in phase two allowed to have meetings with more than 10 people in a room. So that changes team meetings, right? What does that look like? Um, does that mean more potential meetings outside, kind of like classes are? Does that mean um, that you're doing more virtual meetings like we are right now, right? So I think those are the types of things that um, we're gonna have to get used to moving forward. What would checking into the training room with a new injury or for rehab look like? Beth and her team have been working on that. I think the, the process would change again. Um, I think again for the, the, the reasonable, like the, the, the ones that are, are, you know, urgent or matters that need to be taken care of right away, like that, that's, that's separate. That needs to happen. You need to see somebody, um, et cetera. But I do think the chain, the process will change. And I know that Beth and her team are, are working on some of it's outlined in the, the COVID um, action plan. And some of that is, is still coming just in terms of the process. Again, really trying to minimize people working even more through an appointment um, perspective um, and a lot more scheduled appointments and evaluations on site at practice, if that makes sense. In regards to the locker rooms, will the laundry service be available? Yes, yeah, we'll still be con uh, continuing laundry service. What is the threshold for shutting sports down again if people start getting sick? It's a good question. That's really the gating criteria. And I'm, I served on the, um, uh, or am serving on the uh, uh, A10 COVID Medical Advisory Committee. Alana Davidson, uh, women's basketball, is served on our committee representing Davidson as well. Um, and we are working with the A10 to create a gating criteria such that like, what does that threshold look like? Um, again, part of this is we need to get sports up and running, but then if we are running, what does it look like? What is it going to take? Uh, what does the amount of sort of potential cases look like? So we're working through what the gating criteria, criteria looks like such that um, it'll be pretty clear um, and it, it, knowing what that threshold is. Um, and so that's something that we're going to stick to in, along with CDC guidance and along with um, the A10 medical uh, COVID advisory group gating criteria that's established. And again, I go back to my initial point. Everything around this is, is you know, the NCAA talked about it today. It's in jeopardy right now. The fall sports are in jeopardy. And again, I'd say just the fall sports because that's what's in front of us right now. Um, so things have to get a lot better. And, and that's kind of what the A-10 is looking at. Like, we need things to be in, in, in really good shape and, and we need to have our protocols in good order. Again, we're going to maintain the highest standards that the NCAA has put out, but we also need sort of other things to fall in line uh, accordingly such that if we play sports, it's safe to do so. And if we are playing, we're going to do everything that we possibly can. 
Will there be any regulation either by the school or the athletic staff of small groups of athletes meeting on their own to practice? Yes, yes, there will be regulations for sure. Again, I think it's, um, it'll be put in place in conjunction with what Dr. Lutz has put together, what Beth and her team have put together. Um, I know that that's a big part of individual workout, individual instruction. Um, it'll be guided again by local and state. How many people are we talking about meeting together at any given time? I think I mentioned indoors, 10 people, outdoors, 25 people. Um, so it's just having those protocols in place. Um, what we're doing in the weight room and, and the strength and conditioning is going to transfer to practices and going to transfer to small group individual workouts. So we'll have all of those protocols in, in place. Wow, I went through a lot of questions. Um, 8.23, I do want to hard stop at 8.30 and be sensitive to people's time. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? How will the school manage winter sports if students are to leave campus at Thanksgiving and not return until the New Year's? That uh, is a good question. I think we'll have a decision by then. I mean, around the winter sports, you think, again, winter sports are really the ones that have limited time um, for the holidays. If winter sports, let's say, um, winter sports are moving forward, we'll have a decision in place uh, um, by that time such that whether winter sports are pushed back, whether they start on time, um, whether they're allowed to leave campus return and not return, et cetera, um, that will all be figured out down the road. Um, you can envision potentially winter sports going on um, and, um, you know, based on schedules or, or you know, points in the, in the, in, in, on the calendar, it may, may be conference only. So non-conference may not be part of those schedules. Or um, it could be such that you start the winter season um, and there's a truncated break that allows people to come home and come back and quarantine before starting the rest of the winter season. So I think a number of different um, ideas and protocols are, are being, um, being talked through. Will there be any changes regarding dining hall hours for student athletes who may have unusual, unusual schedules for lists and practice. Absolutely, I think um, one of the biggest, the biggest part of this across everything is flexibility. I think dining services is, is moving towards being extremely flexible. I think we're gonna have a lot more information once we get back, if we say we're able to move forward, we have practices set, we have classes set, there could be some really odd hours and, and programming and um, working with dining services in a dining hall to make sure um, that we're able to fit in what we need to do. Um, again, everything is built around flexibility and density. And so um, having things open for different hours than, than normally were in the past helps us. And so being able to work with dining services and auxiliary services to make that happen. You're welcome. Uh, any other questions? Well, unless anybody shoots me a quick chat, um, I will probably disable it so we don't have any more coming through. Um, I really appreciate um, everybody taking the time. Again, I'll kind of end with how I started. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that we're gonna have sports in the fall. Do, I, do we wanna have sports? Do I? Absolutely. Um, but we are going about this in a, methodical, in a methodical way, trying to be as flexible as possible. I really sort of impress upon you all to just bear with us, bear with me. Um, this is not an easy thing to do. The other thing I'd also say is, you know, I know President Quillen's getting a lot of flack and other folks are getting a lot of flack just for the decision around even coming back. Just keep in mind that, um, you know, people really care about what we do. We really care about students. Um, these are not easy decisions. It's really easy to sort of look on the inside, look at the inside from the outside and say, um, this is more reasonable. Like there, there are different ways of doing things. There are different perspectives. Um, everybody knows that, if, if we were um, trying to, to, to say um, not to come back, not to play athletics, understanding that the reason that we're trying to do this is there a value trade-off, right? We, we value in-person education on some level. We value athletics potentially on some level such that we're trying. If we're gonna do it, we're gonna try to mitigate as much risk as possible. Um, and it's hard. And, and it, I, I really do, I feel for, I, I'm talking about athletics. I feel for Dean McRae. I feel for, for, for President Quillen. This is hard, it is not easy. Um, understand that they care deeply. I know Carol deals, cares deeply. I know everybody in, the, in, in decision making positions there care deeply. I know you all do. You all are asking great questions and challenging us as you should. Um, just know that we're in this together. I think that's where athletics has a little bit of an advantage because we're all used to being on a team and really understanding, again, this is my last point, 
in order for this to work, everybody has to be on board. We all have to be on board. We all have to, I mean, we talk about how hard it is to maintain a shared responsibility. It's gonna be damn hard, but even more for athletics. Like I'm asking all of you, in order for this to work, like it has to be that much more so. Everything that goes for students and a shared responsibility is a thousand times, a million times more for, for athletes. Um, in order for this to work, we all have to embrace this. Um, or, or else it's not, and we're not gonna do it. And that's not the end of the world, but we're trying to make it happen, right? Um, we value it. We think there's value in, in, in athletics on this level. Um, we're trying to make it happen. Um, and, and we're gonna do that, but we're gonna do it in a safe way and understand that a lot of the responsibility, the brunt of the responsibility lies on student athletes. So we're asking a lot of you, we're asking you to be leaders in athletics, we're asking you to be leaders with your peers across student, across the student body, we're asking you to, to you know, Carol talked about um, mirroring and, and um, uh, sort of reflecting the behavior. You guys need to be um, reflecting that behavior to a T. Wear a mask, socially distance, understand that we can't take, we can't, we can't um, heighten the risk, especially if we're trying to do what we want to do um, and, and understand the value in that. So um, last thing I'll mention, thanks Katie for reminding me is that this was recorded. Um, so we will work with college relations, excuse me, college communications to get it uploaded either to the college FAQ site, the COVID site and or um, the athletics website so that it can be shared and, and folks that weren't able to join us um, will be on board. Um, thank you all again for taking the time. Um, I'll be in touch very soon. Hope everybody's staying safe and healthy um, and uh, go Cats.